Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of our new Dome to Home series. Yes, we are so excited to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum, and I'm also a presenter and a outreach coordinator here at Fisk. And Jeremy is here, too. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy. And I work at this planetarium as a navigator, a presenter, and also kind of an outreach uh, presenter and navigator. Like uh, when COVID stuff is not really happening anymore, I'll be traveling to uh, different schools and giving presentations. Yeah, and we also have our friend Ramey here. She is our question master for the day. So we want to keep this interactive. We want you guys to be able to an uh, ask questions. So if you have those, just drop them in the chat uh, and she'll be able to relay those to me and Jeremy so we can see those. We'll try to answer some questions as we go, but we're also going to have time dedicated at the end. So if you have any questions, drop them in that chat or hang on to them till the end of the show and then we should be good. All right. <clears throat> So again, thank you for joining us for our first Dome to Home of the semester. We're spending the next 12 weeks talking about Mars and the, in particular, the Perseverance spacecraft that left here on Earth a few weeks ago. It's scheduled to land on Mars in February. And so in preparation for that, we're gonna be talking all about Mars, how we explore it, what we've learned, all kinds of good stuff. So today in particular, we're talking about exploring Mars. We're going to look at the history of Mars exploration and things that we've learned in the last, you know, couple hundred years that we've been looking at Mars. And one of the big questions that we have is, why do we study Mars? What's so cool about Mars? Why is it important that we know about it? There's tons of reasons why Mars is cool and why it's neat that we can know about it. Why do you guys think we might be studying Mars? What's cool about Mars? Any ideas? Well, the fun thing about this question is that it changes over time. We are constantly learning new things. And so why we want to learn these things and why we want to explore changes over time too. And so as we go through the presentation today, I want you guys to kind of think about each step of the way, what we can learn with these different ways of exploring and how they're different and how this question of why explore Mars might change as we go through time. So to start, we're gonna go all the way back in time to like thousands of years ago. We don't really know when Mars was discovered per se, because people have been looking up at the sky and looking at Mars for thousands of years, as far as we know. The Greeks, the Egyptians, Babylonians, long, long time ago, they've always been looking up at the sky and they were able to find Mars. So pretend you know absolutely nothing about Mars and look up at the sky here. Can you see it? I can maybe make it a little bit easier for you. Let's see if Jeremy can help us out. Ta-da! That little crosshairs there, that is Mars. We'll move the sky a little bit so you can see it. So how did they know that that was Mars looking up at the sky? Because you can see here, it just kind of looks like another star. And a lot of times when you look at it out in the sky, you can see Mars from your backyard if it's up, but it just kind of looks like that. It looks like another star. Well, the key lies in how it moves. You can see in the course of one night, Mars moves a lot like the rest of the stars. And generally, stars rise in the east and set in the west, just like the sun does. And in one night, Mars kind of does that too. You can see how it moves there. But if you were to track the, like the starting position of Mars over a long period of time, you'll see that it actually moves a bit differently if you look at it for a really long time. Jeremy can kind of show us how that works. So now you can see Mars is not rising in the east and setting in the west. It's going one way and then it turns around and goes the other way. And then it loops back. 
So if you were a scientist or an observer or anybody long, long time ago before you knew what that was, if you were watching and saw it doing all those strange movements, you would know that that is definitely not a normal star. And so that's basically how they figured out that Mars was not a star, it was a planet because of the way that it moved. But then things got better because eventually we got to a point where we had technology that allowed us to build telescopes. Now telescopes have been around since the 1600s. Galileo built the first telescope as far as we know. The first like real telescope that we think about. That was in like the early 1600s. And so we've been using telescopes to look up at the sky since then. So think about now, what could you see with a telescope that you wouldn't be able to see just with your naked eyes? Any ideas? Probably a lot of really cool stuff. One of those things is you could get a much better look at other planets like Mars. So if you knew Mars was a planet and you wanted to see it up close, you could use a telescope like this. And so that's what they did in the 16 and 1700s were our first real observations of Mars. In 1659, there was a gentleman named Huygens was his last name. He was a Dutch astronomer and he looked at Mars. And again, this is 1650s, so they didn't have cameras. He couldn't take pictures of what his telescope saw, but he could draw. And so we have drawings of what Huygens saw when he looked at Mars. So even though these were great telescopes for the time, 1600s, they still, you know, we could see things like light and dark areas. You could see little bits of Mars. You could tell that maybe Mars was turning because you didn't always see the same dark patches and the same light patches. But then our telescopes got better. Over time, our technology improved. And so we got into say the 1800s, we got better telescopes. There was an Italian astronomer named Schiaparelli who looked at Mars and saw some really cool features different than what Huygens saw, a little more detailed, but he and another gentleman named Lowell who was from the US in the late 1800s looked at Mars and they saw all these lines. And so Schiaparelli looked at these and said that, okay, these could be canals. He called them canali, which in Italian just means like a crack in the ground or a furrow or something like that. Well, Lowell took this to mean canals as in maybe aliens built them. These are actual canals diverting water across the Martian surface. And so he saw, he did the drawings there on the bottom. You can see very straight lines. There's probably areas where he thought that there were little towns or cities. Now we know today that that is not true. There are not people building things on Mars. But this is an important point that we have to think about is that we observe things and we can make inferences based on our observations. But as time goes on and our technology gets better, we may learn things that completely invalidate everything that we thought based on our prior observations. So just like Lowell looked at these and said, those are definitely canals and there's aliens on Mars. Now we know better because our technology has improved and we can move on. That's an important thing to remember, especially in astronomy. This happens all the time. Now our tel telescopes kept improving over time. They got better and better, but we're still on the surface of the earth and looking out at Mars, which means we have things like our atmosphere in the way, clouds, rain, even just the air around us makes it hard to see Mars really well. So we invented space telescopes. Telescopes out in space that don't have to worry about atmosphere and things like that. Probably the most famous one is the Hubble Space Telescope. That's what you see here on the bottom. And these lovely images that Jeremy put up are pictures of Mars taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see we see more detail. We can see not only that Mars has light and dark areas, but we can see more detail about those areas. We can see the ice caps at the north and south poles of Mars. We can see that Mars has an atmosphere, that kind of bluish line around the outside. That's Mars's atmosphere. Very thin, we can even, very thin atmosphere. It is very, very, very thin. Very thin. <laughs> yes, it's only about one-tenth of the atmosphere that we have here on Earth, but it's there. 
And it actually, if we take this and compare these pictures of Mars to the pictures that Huygens drew back in the 1600s, he actually did a pretty good job. I find that very impressive. Yeah, he did, he did quite well with those. <laughs> So we have our telescopes on the ground, we have our telescopes in space, but again, as we learn more and our technology improves, we now have the ability to go to Mars, which is still super exciting. Now there's a couple of different ways that we can get to Mars with spacecraft and a couple of different kinds of spacecraft that we can study Mars with. There's actually a pretty cool graphic here. I'm gonna have Jeremy put up these exploration rings so these rings that just appeared, these are all representative of missions that went to Mars, spacecraft that went to Mars. Now the red ones that you see there, those are Russian missions that failed. The dark blue ones are US missions that failed. But those light blue ones on the outside, that very thin little ring there, those are all the US missions that went to Mars and succeeded. So that means they didn't crash into the surface. They didn't miss Mars entirely, which also happens. Sometimes they will explode before they even leave the launch pad, things like that. Space is really hard. So you can see there were a ton of failures before we actually got good at sending things to Mars. In fact, our first six attempts between 1960 and 1964, the first six of them failed. So it took us a while to get it right. But once we did, we got pretty good at it. Now the first part or the first type of kind of spacecraft that we sent to Mars didn't actually go and stay at Mars. They're what we call flyby missions. So they left Earth, they flew past Mars and they just kept on going. So think of it kind of like if you were driving in a car or on a bus or even just walking past a place, but you weren't gonna pass by again. What kind of things could you observe and learn from just walking right past? Well, in the case of our flybys, we learned quite a bit. The first really successful one was a spacecraft called Mariner 4. We can show you a picture of Mariner here. You can see it's got big solar panels, that radar on the top to send all the data back. Now Mariner 4, because it just flew by and then kept on going, it got a lot of pictures of the surface of Mars, much better than our pictures from Hubble much, much better than our ground-based telescopes. So you can see craters there. You can see a little bit of detail on the ground. But these are still very, very huge areas of the surface. Those are actually really big craters that we're looking at. Because Viking was still, or sorry, Mariner was still in space and going really quickly. So it can only tell us so much. But we can get an idea of what the surface looks like on a large scale. We can make some measurements of that atmosphere and tell things like what it's made out of. Turns out Mars's atmosphere is almost 100% carbon dioxide. Not good for people. We also did some uh, detections of Mars's magnetic field from out in space. That's another thing that you can do when you're looking at a whole planet. You can get a lot of information, but not a lot of small scale detail. So that's when we came up with orbiters. Orbiters are another kind of spacecraft that goes out to the planet, but rather than just flying by and keep on going, it goes into orbit, kind of like satellites here on Earth. It goes up and it stays in one spot a lot of times. Sometimes they move around, but they're passing over the same places over and over and over again. So if we go back to, say, our bus analogy or our car analogy, if you're driving past a place, what if it's somewhere you go every day or every week or even every month or a couple times a month? How much more are you going to learn when you pass by something many times? So we've got a picture here. This is our first really successful orbiter from the U.S. This is Mariner 9. It launched in 1971. Mariner 9 got us much better pictures of the surface. It's still out in space, and so it can only tell us so much about Mars and its surface but its cameras were better. And because it kept passing over those same areas, it was able to take much better pictures. So you can see all sorts of cool stuff that Mariner showed us that we didn't see before. In fact, on the bottom, the very bottom, and then just one to the left, you can see that big crack 
that big valley, it's the same thing that you see in Jeremy's background back here. It's called the Valis Marineris, and they actually named it after the Mariner spacecraft because it was the first one to observe this giant canyon. This is actually the biggest canyon in the entire solar system. It's twice as deep as the Grand Canyon, and if you were to set it down here on Earth, it would stretch all the way from Los Angeles to New York City. It is huge. And we also see there's things that kind of look like creek beds that are all dried up. The one just to the right of the bottom, is that giant volcano, is the largest mountain in the solar system, appropriately called Olympus Mons. That's another one. If you, It's three times as tall as Mount Everest, and if you set it down here in the U.S., it would cover the entire state of Colorado. It is a big mountain. Very big. And Mars is only about half the size of the Earth, a little bit bigger than half. So for it to have the biggest canyon and the biggest volcano is pretty interesting. It has all these huge features on a tiny little planet. Mariner was also the first one to take pictures, really good pictures, of Mars's moons, which is what you see kind of the top left corner. Mars has two very tiny little moons called Phobos and Deimos. They're very, very small. Oftentimes you hear them called space potatoes because they're not even big enough to be round. They're just kind of lumpy little rocks. But that was our first really good look at Mars's moons. Now, orbiters are still super popular because we do get a lot of good information. And even now, there are still tons of orbiters going around Mars, really similar to how we have a lot of satellites going around the Earth. Mars doesn't have quite as many because it's Mars. It's hard to get to. But we have things like the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MAVEN, EMM. These are all different orbiters that are out in space. And Jeremy's put up some pictures here. So you can see most of them have solar panels and use solar power. They've all got radio dishes. But other than that, they're all a bit different. And they all do different things. And much like Mariner, they're good at taking pictures of the surface. In fact, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter takes some of the best pictures of Mars's surface that we've ever gotten. We're going to put some of these up for you. See how much better those are than the old Mariner pictures? Now, granted, it's been 40 years now. Mariner 9 was in 1971, and now we're in 2020. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is still up in space, and it's still orbiting Mars and taking pictures. In fact, it's taken thousands of pictures. So if you ever have a lot of time on your hands and just want to look at a whole bunch of really pretty pictures of Mars, you can Google Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and you'll get all sorts of crazy images like this. Spend, spend lots and lots of time looking through all the, all the crazy and really interesting uh, images that MRO has taken. Uh, it's good to point out too that <clears throat> uh, these are all, most of the ones that you'll find, or I shouldn't say most, but a lot of the images that you find uh, on that website uh, are indeed actually false color images. Um, there is not purple sand and blue impact craters on Mars. Um, these are falsely colored after the fact to uh, make it easier to see some of these features. Sadly, no blue sand. Mars is actually just really red. Just like you see in my picture behind me and Jeremy's, that's Mars. The whole planet is very, very red. And part of that is because it's mostly made out of iron dust. And that iron out in space will rust. Just like we have rust here on Earth, the iron in the sand on Mars rusts. And so that's what all the orange stuff is and the reddish stuff. It's just rust. All of Mars is very, very rusty. So we've talked about different spacecraft that have flown past Mars, things that are orbiting Mars. But there's also another thing we can do. Now we can land things on the surface of Mars. Now this is incredibly difficult, but the first one was in 1975. So actually quite a long time ago, we were able to land things on Mars. This is a picture of the first lander called Viking. There's actually two of them, Viking 1 and 2. They were identical, so they both look like this. So these were our first landers that landed on the surface of Mars. So let's stick with our analogy here. What's something else, things that you could see if you were actually went to a place? If you got off the bus and checked out this place that you kept driving by, if you were standing there on the surface, what are some things that you could see or observe? 
or find. The only drawback to landers is that they don't go anywhere. They land on the surface and they can examine their surroundings, things that are right around them, underneath them, above them, but they don't go anywhere. So we can learn a lot of stuff about the surface of Mars, but only within, you know, a little area. Now imagine here on Earth, if all you had to go on was, you know, maybe a couple square feet of ground, would that tell you about the entire planet? Probably not. The planet is very diverse. There's a whole lot of different stuff. There's deserts and jungles and oceans. Mars probably doesn't have deserts and jungles and oceans, but there are lots of different things happening on its surface. So that's kind of a, a drawback to landers. They are very informative. So the next step in our innovation was to create rovers. So these are little, kind of like little cars. They would go with a lander. So a lander would drop down onto the surface and release its little, uh, its little friend, its little robot. You see here on the ground, I love this little guy. This is a picture of our first lander rover pair. The lander was called Pathfinder. And then the rover on the bottom is called Sojourner. And it was not very big. It was like two feet by one feet. About 25 pounds. You could just pick it up and carry it around. <laughs> Jeremy, I think, said it was about the size of his dog. Yeah, <laughs> it's about the size of my dog, Comet. <laughs> so these are cute little things. You see it's got its little solar panel on top. But this is the first time that we were able to leave that little square area that our lander landed on and could actually go out and explore things farther away. So again, think about things that you could learn if you weren't just standing in one spot, if you actually got to go places and explore things that are farther away. Now these little tiny rovers like this can only go so far. They do have solar panels and as long as there's light, they can stay active. But you see those tiny little wheels and you can see like the picture in my background here, Mars is rocky. There's a lot of big rocks and boulders. Again, there's giant canyons and craters. And so it's difficult for something tiny like that to really get too far. So since then we've built bigger and better rovers. These two here, these are Spirit and Opportunity, two of the first really big rovers that we landed. You can see they're much bigger. They have bigger solar panels, larger wheels. They could get over some of those big rocks that are on the ground. We had Phoenix after that, and then the uh, Mars Science Laboratory and its rover, Curiosity. Not a lot of people talk about Mars Science Laboratory. That's the lander that took Curiosity down with it. So Curiosity is the one on the top there. That's where my background picture came from. That was a picture from Curiosity. You may have seen lots of pictures from Curiosity recently. We've got a couple other ones there. There was also the new InSight lander, uh, which again, landed on the surface. It didn't have a rover with it, but it's doing a lot of measurements of things like earthquakes or technically Mars quakes. Anytime the ground shakes on Mars, it's got a little probe that measures that. It's taking other atmospheric measurements, and things like that. So by being on the ground, we can learn more things about the surface of the planet. We can also take atmospheric measurements that are more on a localized scale, like say the weather in Boulder versus the weather in all of the United States or even the entire planet. So we get much more detail when we're talking about landing on a planet. And of course, next we have Perseverance which is our upcoming lander rover combo. Perseverance is gonna land on the surface of Mars. And then it also has this little helicopter that's going with it. So this is its little version of kind of like a Sojourner rover, except it's a helicopter and it's gonna hop from place to place on the surface. We're hoping it flies really well in Mars's very, very thin atmosphere like we talked about. And the next step after this, we're hoping, will be to send people to Mars. Because there's a lot of stuff that a person could learn rather than a robot. It's kind of like if you like sent your friend out to go explore and just looked at their pictures that they took or videos that they took from walking around, but you can't really tell them on the fly. You can't be like, ooh, that's a cool rock. Go look at that. We don't have that ability to do that with our robots. Our robots have to be pretty well pre-programmed. 
So if you have people that can go and actually make those split second decisions of that looks cool, I want to go look at that. An actual person with like a rock hammer who can go and pick something up and look at it and break it apart. You can get even more detailed information. And with that, that kind of outlines our entire history of Mars exploration. And I bet there were some good questions that popped up in that 20 minutes. So I want to give you guys a chance to ask some of those questions, see if we can answer any of those for you. Yeah, and when we wait uh, for some of these questions to roll in, um, I know a lot of the stuff we kind of talked about uh, very quickly, but we do have, you know, this is a whole, whole Perseverance to Mars series. Um, the full schedule of the shows should be listed uh, down below uh, in the description of this video. So if you have really burning questions or want to find out really a lot more detail about uh, any of those specifics, uh, definitely come and join us on one of the future shows. Let's see, when we wait uh, for some questions to roll in here, I did want to show you guys, so we talked a little bit about uh, the different orbiters and then the different landers, and then the different rovers. Um, I wanted to show you guys a little bit of a size comparison of some of the rovers, just to give you uh, a little sense of how much they've grown and how the technology has changed. Um, so here's that little, the small little guys, the, the little first uh, rover that we sent to Mars, the uh, Sojourner, the first successful one. And then we have Opportunity, which was the twin of Spirit, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, to the left of these humans there, or to their right, I guess. And then uh, the Curiosity rover. Um, so you can really see how, especially the wheels have grown uh, in the different generations of those rovers. Which also happens because we're learning more and more about the terrain on Mars, which is again, a hard thing to see from up in space. You don't know that there's tons of even decent sized rocks that a little cereal box rover would have a hard time getting over. So you see Curiosity's got those big old honking wheels with really deep tread. So it's gone up inclines and down ravines and over boulders. These are all exciting things that these rovers get to do. So it's really fun. Let's see, else? what else, what else? Does anybody have any burning questions about the history of Mars? Why we focus so much on Mars? Um, it's easily the most studied planet uh, in our solar system, other than the Earth, of course. Absolutely. A part of that is, I think, because the more we learn about Mars, the more interesting and hospitable it sort of seems. Some of the other planets in our solar system, like gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, they don't have a place for us to land. They're just made out of gas, so we can't really live there. Other planets like Venus are really, really hot. They have a really thick, nasty, acidic atmosphere, which would be hard for people to deal with. But Mars is one of those places where the atmosphere is not great. The temperatures aren't ideal, but it's pretty close. So that's a big thing about Mars. And a big reason why people want to go to Mars is because it's probably the second most hospitable place that we could go as humans. It could be relatively easy for us to live on and understand. We also learn things like Mars has water on it, not liquid water anymore, but it has a ton of water ice. It's got those ice caps, just like Earth does at the North and South Pole, which have a ton of water ice in them. Mars is also so cold that it has a lot of carbon dioxide ice. You may have heard of it as dry ice that we have here on Earth. Here on Earth, it's not cold enough for it to stay as ice for too long. That's why it turns into smoke and drifts away. But on Mars, it's so cold and the atmosphere is so thin that it just stays as ice, which is pretty neat. Well, if we don't have any burning questions, we will go ahead and wrap up for today. If you think of any, go ahead and come back and drop those in the YouTube comments here. You can also email them to us. There should be a link to our website down below. 
And again, like Jeremy said, there's our full schedule available. So you should definitely come back and visit us next week. This is happening every week at the same time, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. So definitely come back for the rest of our series. This is going for 12 weeks. So we're gonna have tons of cool information, tons of fun. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of those episodes. There's also an option if you'd like to donate to help us continue to put on programming like this while the Fisk Theater is closed. We would love to see you again next week. Otherwise, have a great week, you guys. Yeah, and if you guys uh, liked these videos, definitely share us, share, but share them with your friends. Uh, get the word out there. Obviously, we're doing this all for you guys. Uh, we love kind of all the uh, feedback and interactions that we're getting. So um, until then, see you guys next week.